And I remember when it, it was all over, I went next to her. I touched her forehead and told her, Mama, even in death, I love you. And I pulled the, the white bed sheet over her face. I was the last one to walk out of the ICU. As I shut the door, I looked uh, at her again and I told her, Mama, thank you for everything that you have done to us. Go well. Being in the scouts, I had access to a cleaning closet under the stairs. It was so tiny, it's like uh, four feet by five. That became my hostel. From Monday to Friday, I'll talk nicely to the head cook. Then if the coma kuna chakule mebaki, ananiwekea Whenever you're going, whenever you're seeking opportunities abroad, make sure you leave your pride here in Kenya. Because out there, things are totally different. The systems are totally different. And actually, most of the things people consider to be like awkward jobs or odd jobs, they give you the flexibility to do other things. And also, people make so much money from them rather than being employed in an office, being paid monthly. <laughs> Hello and welcome to today's episode of Inspire Kenya. My name is Lynn Gugi. Now, my guest today knows what it feels to sleep hungry to affording a three-course meal, sleeping in the slums to living in an amazing house and going to school and being chased out due to lack of fees to studying in the best universities in the United States. He also works as an Uber driver and he is encouraging Kenyans to find pride in doing what they love most. His story is about to inspire you. But before we get to listen to him, allow me to say a huge thank you to KCB Bank for sponsoring this episode of Inspire Kenya and allowing me to bring you content that has the potential to impact your life. Hello, my name is Anthony Alex Irongo, and my principle in, in life is to do great things in small ways, mm -hmm. to enlighten, equip, and empower others for the glory of God. Yeah. Yes. Thank you so much. And Anthony, looking back, it's so hard for someone to believe that you once used to work in Amjengo, ulikuna chotea watu maji, to be where you are right now, your story is super inspirational. So it will take us through your story. Thank you so much, <laughs> Lina. I remember a long time ago, I was born in at Kiambu General Hospital, raised in the village, in Mothidi village. Mm -hmm. Then we came to Kariubangi South, where I started schooling at Kariubangi South Primary School. Mm -hmm. Then my parents' situation wasn't that good and uh, so we moved to Dandora, mm -hmm. then from there we went to Kiambu town mm -hmm. and I continued schooling at the uh, Church of Primary School. Then along the way my dad just decided to, to abandon us and my mom was left to struggle. And uh, she was uh, selling a kiosk, selling vegetables and all that, but also it wasn't doing good and uh, she sought employment in coffee farms around Kiambu. Mm. And uh, most of the times, especially on the weekends, Saturdays, we would go pick coffee together. And once in a while, she would get sick and she would get admitted at Kiambu General Hospital. Mm. And uh, during such times, I would miss school, go to the coffee farms, pick around 20 debes or 20, 20 liter containers, five mm -hmm. of them, mm -hmm. get paid, do the shopping, go home, help my brothers to pre to shower, then I'll prepare dinner, then go to the hospital and see my mom. And uh, it continued like that, and uh, the situation at the school wasn't that good either. Mm -hmm. Most of the times, mm -hmm. I'll be sent home for lack of simple things like books 
and pencils. And I remember one teacher, teacher Margaret, would come looking for me. And it's like, Anthony, Rudy Shule, I'll buy you the textbooks. God bless her soul. I understand that as she passed away mm -hmm. many years ago. Mm. The situation got worse and my mom decided to try her luck in Nairobi. So me and my younger, my second, I'm the first, my second born brother, we were taken to the village in Mudivi. Mm. And my mom moved to Moroto Slums, which is uh, next to country, which was country, next to country bus station. Country bus station. Mm. And uh, in the village, life was equally hard. There was no space for me because I was a big boy then. And so I, I, I got this uh, chicken house. I converted it into my cube, as we say. <laughs> and uh, it was so tiny that uh, I would, I, I, it's only the bed which could fit there. Mm. So we were there and my cousins, my grandpa was working in Nairobi as a watchman, mm -hmm. my grandma, was taking care of a relative's farm in the Rift Valley. So we were, we were raising ourselves. Here we are, children, raising ourselves. Sometimes my mom would send something, but sometimes she wouldn't. Such times we would just go foraging in the farm, looking for anything to eat, to eat like a, anything like a, a potato which was forgotten. And a potato, anything, mangoes, anything would survive like that. Mm. Back in Nairobi, I remember one time I came to visit with my grandma and I found my mom, my dad, had reappeared in Moroto. Your dad now? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, okay, I'm here to stay for the school holidays. Then the dad was like, no, you're not staying. You have to go back to Shago. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't, I, I never want, I didn't want my mom to be beaten because I understand my dad used to beat my mom. He was violent. He was a violent man. Mm -hmm. So uh, I was like, okay, I, I knew where to find my grandma Gekomba, so I followed her, I know where I can find her. Then my mom came later and said, Anthony, uh, you understand the situation? You have to go back home. So my dad never accepted me. And I understand that uh, he died in the 1990s, towards around 98. And um, I made peace with that fact that uh, he rejected me. And even right now, I'm at peace with that. Yeah, so... How did it feel like for you as a young man growing up, huh? knowing, yes, I have a dad, but this dad will never accept me? To some extent, I was devastated. But I knew there is life beyond that because you can't force people to accept you in their lives. Good. As much as you are a biological son, you can still force them. These things we do willingly. Yeah, so I was like, okay then, if you don't want me, still I have bigger dreams, I have a greater vision. So that's what happened. Then uh, a few months down the line, the Moroto slums was demolished and my mom just moved across the road to Mudurua, mm. where she got this tiny little house called Gashambi. And uh, during school holidays, I would come to visit. And uh, it was so tiny that uh, we could only sleep under the bed. Then my mom, my, the house self, and my sister, who was just a few months old, they would uh, share the bed. Your house was tiny? Like a seven feet by Four. So you guys used to sleep under the bed. Under the bed. So kuna watu juu ya kitanda, alafu kuna wengine chini. Yes. Kwa floor chini. The, the, we the three boys. Yes. Chini ya bed. Ah yeah yeah. And so my mom usiku wa kitoka kama anaenda to the bathroom, we should be very careful not to step on our heads. Wow. Yeah. I still remember even if today we go to that that place, I can show you that tiny house. Mm. Then from the uh, back in the village, I was able to clear my primary school and I remember very well the day I sat for my last paper mm -hmm. I had packed everything I was so I was so tired of the life there here we are sometimes I would just go hungry and you're going to school nobody even the teacher wants to understand your situation it's okay 
And uh, after I sat for my last paper, I didn't even wait for lunch. I was on, on my way to Nairobi, to my mom's place. By then, now uh, <coughs> she had moved to Kasara, Mweki in Kasarani. That's uh, ni- 92. Mm. Then uh, 93, she, by then she was hawking clothes and all that. Uh, she had a stall at uh, Muthurwa Market around there and also at Uhuru Market near Aquinas High School. And uh, so the following year, that's 96, I started schooling there at Aquinas High School. And my mom was struggling so much to pay for my school fees and even to provide for my fare. Most of the times, I'll just go home, then wait for a few weeks, Go, I go back to school with nothing, except a note from my mom. is like, like, okay, allow my kid, I'll pay on this date. And I, I continued like that. Uh, then came Form 4, I was, uh, as I was pre- Form 4, I was appointed a senior prefect mm. because of my leadership our capabilities and uh, the same year that's 96 it was very rough for my mom because her business wasn't doing good she couldn't even afford the bus fare so i decided to stay at school mm-hmm. this is a day school but even there were other students so i joined them and uh, being in the scouts i had access to a cleaning closet under the stairs it was so tiny it's like uh, four feet by five that became my hostel from Monday to Friday. I'll talk nicely to the head cook. Then uh, if the koma kuna chakule mebaki, ananiweke ya jioni. On Friday evening, I go home so that I can do laundry. Then on Saturday, naenda kuare, kutafuta mm. vibarua. Mm. I'll just go there, work the whole day, and get around 150 shillings. Yuko Kasarani, we have a lot of uh, stone quarries. Mm. I cleared high school. 97, I wanted to go to the university, but my mom couldn't afford anything. So I started uh, a, a green grocery kiosk selling vegetables. And I remember walking from Weki to Githurai at around 5 in the morning. You're just walking through the bush. Sometimes you would hear people screaming, people being robbed, people being stabbed. But Nendalia too, because you can't go back home. You have no choice. Whatever happens, at least you tried. And then I go, I come back home around 6, 6.30, I'm back home, and Kutembea. Then I started evening classes, so I was going to go to back around uh, 3, nafunga, na enda Kenya Polytechnic, which is now known as the Technical University of Kenya. I was taking a diploma in, in banking. I was a class from uh, 6 to 8, rush back home, open the soko around 9, do my homework until around 11, go to bed, wake up at 4.30. Psycho continued for one year. Then I ran out of money. And uh, I kept on doing any jobs I could find. Kwa mjengo ni mefanya maaji, hawking bananas, hawking clothes, even going to industry area looking for jobs. I have worked at Karyobangi Light Industries. 2005, the little money I had saved, I decided to go back to college. This time I went to Kenya School of Monetary Studies so that I can continue with my diploma. But six months down the line, once again, Pesa Imeisha. From there, I remember one time I was like, God, you know I'm smart. And nothing is working for now. <laughs> but if you ever give me a chance, to pursue my academic dreams, I will help others to do so. Mm-hmm. From 2001, I was just looking for any opportunity and all that. I remember going for these education expos at the Sarit Center. You go there, you get on the spot admission to universities in the UK, the US, mm-hmm. Asia, and all that. But then Unambiwa, let a 10% deposit, we give you the I-20. The I-20 is the, like, uh, the a, a document just to enable you to oh. travel as a student. Mm. By then, Pengina turned into 20 bob fair. So, I would, but I, would, I wouldn't give up. I did it over and over again. I didn't give up. 
St that time still I was very active in church. I was playing the keyboard and uh, I was getting around 250 shillings every Sunday. Then uh, it, it was increased to around 500 and that kept me going. So from 2000 to 2007, I was trying for this opportunity. Then the opportunity came to go to the US. And I remember when I got that visa, the first person I called is my mom. Wow. I told her, my mom, the Lord has heard your prayers. I'm going to the US. Then on 18 September 2008, I went to the US. I went to Pittsburgh. I was hosted by a family friends. October, I started working right away. I was working in a senior living facility. This is where by the old people go mm. for retirement. Mm. And some of the, them, either they are too old, they are too weak, or they have some medical conditions, so yeah. they need 24-hour care. Mm. And I started right away. 2009, the little had saved. I started college at the community college of Allegheny County. I was pursuing my associate degree in business management. Nikafanya up to around 2011. Mm. At the same time, my sister had stayed home for almost four years after Kumaliza High School. I remember the promise I made to God that I will help others achieve their yes. academic dreams. So you started with yeah, your so sister? Yes, I started paying for her fees at uh, Kenyatta University. She was pursuing her law degree. But from there then I saw, let me move her to a private one. So I moved her to Catholic University of East Africa. Mm. And she continued. After I was done with my two-year uh, degree at the community college, I started my bachelor's in business administration at the University of Maryland University College. 2014, I graduated with honors. Wow. My sister graduated with honors. Wow. And so we held a joint graduation party. Beautiful. And we invited all the people. <laughs> Back to around 2010, October, my mom was diagnosed with stage 4 breast cancer. And uh, me and my brother, we were in a position to help her to start the treatment. Then uh, it continued up to around 2013. We have done our best seek help elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And I remember I was so devastated because I knew this was a 50-50 chance. But I told God, God, I'll do whatever it takes to make sure my mom gets the treatment. No matter what happens, at least I tried. Mm -hmm. So I approached one of the hospitals there in Pittsburgh. It's called, the, it's part of the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. And the doctor was like, yes. My, your mom needs to come here. Mm. My mom went, she got a visa and came. Mm. But uh, that is now around September there. Ar around o the same towards the end of September, her situation Wasn't. worsened. I remember we were in the house, we woke up. I found, we found our mom walking, just walking up and down the house. She wasn't speaking, she was just staring at us. So we rushed her to the hospital and they told her there was an infection which was spreading very fast. Mm. That night, she was taken to the ICU and I decided to spend the night there. I was still doing my bachelor's degree and uh, I remember I was doing my homework mm. around 1 a.m. and she woke up and she told me, Anton, you're still doing your homework. Mind you, I was so afraid to sleep. There was enough space for me to sleep. Even the nurses had given me a pillow. They had given me some blankets. But I was afraid that uh, if I sleep, your eyes. I, might, I might wake up and find her dead. Mm. So I couldn't. So come to Nafanya assignments, you people, if it comes to the worst, you should let me go. Because already we had told her earlier on that uh, if the treatment still goes through, she might be left with permanent disabilities and should be put up in a nursing home. 
Then uh, point number two, make sure faith, that's my sister, finishes her education. Number three, I see that you have education. And may the Lord enable you to go as far as your heart mm. desires. Mm. The last one, but that time I'm going to find renovations at uh, my grandma's house, can I be Anthony, make sure the renovations are finished. And I told her, yes ma'am, I'll do that. 11th October 2013, I was at work and I was at work and I was at work. Dr. your mom has less than six hours to live. I called everybody, I called my pastor, my brother, friends, and we assembled at the hospital. We surrounded our mom, we did the final prayers. And we waited for six hours and 11 minutes for her to die. And I remember <coughs> when I was waiting, I was busy making body preparations. I knew the burden ahead of me was heavy. Here she is dying in a foreign land, and she had to be brought back home for burial. Then around 12, 11, there is this sound whenever you're watching the movie, like in the ICU, somebody's dying, there is this machine which goes, tee, 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 tee. exactly that happened. Even up to this day, that, that sound is still stuck in my mind. And I remember when it, it was all over, I went next to her. I touched her forehead and told her, Mama, even in death, I love you. And I pulled the white bed sheet over her face. I was the last one to walk out of the ICU. As I shut the door, I looked at her again and I told her, Mama, thank you for everything that you have done to us. Go well. There, from there we went to the funeral. The funeral home was taking over and all that. A lot of paperwork was involved. We had the Kenyan embassy in Washington DC. They had some documents they were supply, supposed to supply. We had that local funeral home. We had the, the one in, another one in Delaware which does international shipping, shipping. of human remains. Mm -hmm. And we had the receiving mm. funeral home here in Kenya which mm. was uh, the KKU funeral home. Mm. And then there were the, the, the flight to bring her back. A lot was going on. But then, by then we had formed a, a group called Pamoja Foundation. And in that group, we provide financial services for me. We provide finances for members to enable them to travel yeah. back home to bury their loved, loved ones. ones. And currently I'm the CEO and the chairman of the board. Mm -hmm. So we were able to raise the amount quickly and we were able to bring mom home. Yeah. I remember I went to the JKI airport and rather than going to the international arrivals where people go to receive their loved ones coming back, I went to the cargo center and uh, there was my mom in a wooden shipping box. From there we went to the funeral home at KU because I had to certify it mm. was her. We opened the box. And there she laid, cold, still, but she was still beautiful and at peace. No more pain, no more suffering. Then the day came, 2nd November. I was the first one to get to the funeral home. I, I was the one to check her out. I went there, I went in there, and there she was, beautiful, mm -hmm. in her mother's union uniform. And so we went to the village. And we laid did. Her to rest. We laid her to rest. And I remember that, that day, I walked like 20 meters carrying her to her final resting place. Mm. So when we were doing the graduation, the 2014, with my sister, that's one person we missed. We missed her so much. I remember even that day, I cried because I wish she had lived to see such moments. But God had other plans for her. Mm. So after that, I enrolled for an MBA at the California University of Pennsylvania. Mm. 
Then also my sister went to Kenya School of Law. Mm -hmm. And 2016, I graduated with my MBA. Wow. And I was uh, top of the class. Mm. Then our 20, the same year, my sister was admitted to the bar. Mm. She became an advocate of the high court. I remember going to, going to the ceremony, and here I was as a brother and as, as a, a father, father figure. figure. And I remember the words my mom told me, make sure faith finishes our education. And I was so grateful to God that he had given me an opportunity Amazing. to fulfill my mother's dying yeah. wish. Yes. So after my master's, I was like, okay, my mom told me to go as far as the Lord can. Takes you. Who am I? It becomes a PhD program at mm. Liberty University. Mm -hmm. And uh, up to th today, I'm doing my research. I've already started my research. Mm. Last week, I finished one of my class. That's, uh, it was 16 weeks. Yes. It's a very intense class. Mm -hmm. I finished the class. I passed very well. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And now, God willing, in a few months, yes. I'll complete my program and I'll be Dr. Anthony Alex Irongo. Dr. Anthony <laughs> yes. Alex Irongo. Yes. And we'll be right here to celebrate. Yes, I'll you. make sure you people come. Yes. yes. <laughs> amazing. Yes. That's amazing. Thank you so much. Wow. Mm. Let me ask you, right now in the US, what do you do to earn a living? Okay, right now I do three things. <laughs> I do business consultancy. Focusing on business strategies, leadership, and personal development. That's your firm? Yeah, the Apris Strategies. That's my company I started. Mm -hmm. And still, it's speaking. Uh, the COVID happened, then uh, I know all businesses are affected. Mm -hmm. But that has been my passion. Mm -hmm. Because when I look at those three things, there is a very strong relationship. Because mm -hmm. for a business to be great, it requires great leaders. And for you to become a great leader, you must be a person of great character and integrity. Mm -hmm. So everything is related. Mm -hmm. Yes. Then, before I came, I was working uh, as a health care professional. Yes. But, but I had to resign so that uh, I can be here for a few months to pursue some things I was doing. Mm -hmm. On Fridays and Saturdays, mm -hmm. if I'm not tired, I do Uber. I'm an Uber driver. Our city is a college city. We have like six universities. So I do Uber f the whole of Friday night and Saturday night and the money I get is, uh, is what I use to pay for my school mm. and also for my expenses, especially traveling back and forth between Pittsburgh and Nairobi. Mm -hmm. Because of the events which happened in the past, I'm a father mm -hmm. to a nine-year-old daughter. Lovely. That's also my inspiration. Mm -hmm. And also I'm a father figure to my sister. I'm the head of the household now in our family that now we don't have a mom and dad. And also, like in the village, whenever there is something to do with our family, you I am the representative. representative. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yes. Okay. So I do those three things. So you have to keep coming back, Kenya and U.S., Kenya y and U.S. Yes, actually for me, it's like I spend uh, like uh, seven months in the U.S., mm -hmm. five years. But on average, I'm here three to four times every year. Three to four times every year. Yes. Every Friday and Saturday, you are an Uber driver. Yes, there I do a 12-hour shift. 12-hour shift? Yes. There was a conversation. One mm. of our top comedians mm -hmm. uh, went to the US, and now he's an Uber driver. Mm -hmm. And I remember there was a conversation, people saying, that job, why is he an Uber driver? Mm -hmm. There's other jobs he can do rather than be an Uber driver. For you, as someone who has experienced life in the US, mm -hmm. Is there anything wrong with such jobs? Because personally, I don't think there is. No. Mm -hmm. The problem is with the people. One thing I encourage people is that whenever you're going, whenever you're seeking opportunities abroad, make sure you leave your pride here in Kenya. Because out there, things are totally different. The systems are totally different. And actually, most of the things people consider to be like awkward jobs or odd jobs, they give you the flexibility to do other things and also people make so much money from them rather than being employed in an office being paid monthly. Mm -hmm. Because such jobs like working in the healthcare, being an Uber, you're, you're like earning every hour. 
Yeah, so there's nothing wrong like with that for me because I wanted the flexibility to move back and forth between Nairobi and Pittsburgh. An office job is not good for me because an office job I'll be paid per month and every year I'm entitled to two or three weeks mm -hmm. leave. Mm -hmm. That one can't work for me because mm -hmm. I need to be here like uh, every year at least a minimum of four months. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's why I do what the, we call odd jobs. Mm. But once you leave your pride, kazi So usiende uko na pride. Ah, pride watch up. Uh, make sure you dump it on your way to the airport. Mm. Dump it along Mombasa Road hapo. Uache, uache. It doesn't matter. Yes. You can be a senior manager here, but when you come there, the only job you can find kazi ya kufagia. Yeah, because there the system there is built on trust. It's not about your qualifications. Mm -hmm. It's a trust. Okay. And they trust you. And they trust you. Yeah. Okay. Well, as as a, as a Kenyan who is able to live in both worlds, uh, mm -hmm. you've been to the US and you are here in Kenya. Mm -hmm. What is it that we Kenyans are doing wrong when we go out mm -hmm. that limits us from saving and investing? So you see someone has been in the US for like two decades or 20 years, mm -hmm. but when they come back home, they have nothing to show for it. What are we doing wrong? Uh, I think you are one thing we I think is uh, we lack goal or we lack purpose in life because before you do something you must have a uh, what do you want to achieve mm -hmm. why am I doing this where do I want to be then after that all those questions we should be able to do that like for me I knew I'm going to the US for school for the f almost 10 years I have been there I get very nice corporate jobs I'm Anthony I, because uh, my CV is out there. Anthony, there's this job. You qualify for this job. Can you finish the application? Then I'm like, no. Why? Because I need the flexibility right now to work hard at school because that's my priority number one. Then also the family and all that. So it's good to have those goals and be disciplined enough. Focus on them. Otherwise, out there, there are so many things uh, which can lead you astray. Mm. Yes, mm -hmm. and that's what happens to most of the people. Mm. They are like, okay, I'm going to the US, but even they are not sure what they'll be doing, so they'll be just moving from one thing to the next, one thing to the next. Mm. But for me, since I went to the US and started school in May, in summer 2009, I have been in school taking classes back to back so that I don't lose the motivation. Mm -hmm. yes. Stay focused. Stay focused. Stay focused. Mm. Let me ask you, um, right now, you're still in school. Yes. What inspires you to keep dreaming and to keep learning, mm -hmm. even though some people would say, Ai, uh, nafanya nini shule sahi? Because, uh, remember that vow I made to God? Yes. I was so passionate about the academics. I wanted to become like a lecturer, a professor, I wanted to do three things. Teach at a university, do research, and also do consultancy. That's what drove me. Actually, when I finished my MBA, I was like, can I stop here? Then I'm like, no, I want to teach at a university. And nowadays, they are only taking a PhD, PhDs and doctorates. That's what kept me mm. going. Mm. Then another thing, as I said, I was smart, but I couldn't get the opportunity. So when the opportunity came, kachukua to yote, all the way to the end. Mm. Yes. Looking back from where you've come from, yes, the slum, Mjengo, Mwiki, Kibanda, to where you are right mm -hmm. now, what are you most proud of? I'm proud number one for God, even for getting me through that. Maybe I needed that so that I can develop the character I have right now. I needed that to develop the resilience I have. I needed that to get the motivation. I have the motivation which keeps me going. Mm. And uh, what I'm so grateful of is that uh, those opportunities, they were, they, they were just learning moments for me. Yes. They were learning moments. Yes, mm -hmm. those hard lessons. Mm. Yeah, okay. Suffering should n should not be a rite of passage, <laughs> but this is life. We Lakini don't pia hakuna charahisi. Yeah, hakuna charahisi. Eh, yes. Lazima mtu wafanyikazi. Yeah, you must work hard. Mm. Because then, 
if we, if we were able to get everything we needed in this world, mm -hmm. life, will, life will be so boring. You get a job, you buy one car, two cars, you buy a house, another house, then nothing. Mm. Yeah. So actually even would have nothing like uh, anything to inspire anybody. Mm. Yes. Okay. Um, talk to young people or just talk to Kenyans in general. Motivate them. Because mm -hmm. uh, no, I always say sometimes people even just listening to these episodes, it elevates them. It okay. motivates them. Uh. So if you were to advise someone who is watching you right now, what would you tell them? You uh, can just look straight there. Uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll say three things. Number one, have a higher purpose greater than your needs. Mm -hmm. It's not just about working and spending the money. Go there, serve the Lord first, offer yourself to the services of other people, help other people. Then finally, put yourself last. Number two, have goals in life. These are the things you want to accomplish. Then pursue them, focus. Mm -hmm. on the process. The process is very important because the product is as good as the process used. Focus on the process. And if something happens, still remain focused, but you can make some adjustments here and there. And finally, never lose hope. Keep on trying. You fail once, try for the second time. You fail, you have all the chances from one to one million over and over again and you're guaranteed one of them will definitely work. You're guaranteed? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much, Anthony. You're we welcome. wish you all the best. Huh? Yes. But before I conclude this episode, I always ask, is there anything you think we should have talked about that we left out? Uh, not much, but uh, I have two important people in my life. Yes, please. My sister? Yes. Yeah. She's more than a sister to me. Mm -hmm. She's like a firstborn. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And I love her so much. She also, also inspires me because, uh, yeah, she is. She's a lawyer, but uh, a few years ago, she was nobody. I have my daughter. Mm -hmm. She's just nine, but she gives me a lot of uh, encouragement. Sometimes she wakes up and, uh, Baba, you're still doing the schoolwork. Can I help you? Then I'm like, okay, <laughs> <laughs> this, this is a PhD program and yes. you are in grade three. Yes. But it's okay, you can help me. Uh, then what I do is I take time to explain things to her. Mm -hmm. If she asks me, what does this mean? This paper you are writing, what is it about? So I take time. All I do is just I break down the information to mm -hmm. her level. Mm -hmm. And she always enjoys mm -hmm. that, yes. Yeah. And I'm so thankful to God. Mm -hmm. Then the other one is my grandma. Show, show. Show, show. I love her so much. Yeah. Because early on when I was young, uh, she took care of me and she's just one amazing woman. Mm -hmm. Yes, I know she has gone through yes. pain losing her daughter. Actually, there are one, two, two of the, almost three of them now, mm. but she's always strong. She's always there. Yeah. Whenever I have time, I call her, funny jokes and all that. If I have the opportunity, we are just like one hour from here. Yeah. So we just go and visit her. Mm -hmm. And I'm so thankful to God, yeah. even for all my friends, who have been my support system. Mm -hmm. I, there are some friends, even when we were nobodies, mm. we still st we stuck together. We have uh, shared values, the same mindset, vision. and all the shared vision, mm. and we are always grateful to God mm -hmm. for what he has done in yeah. our lives. Yes. yes. All right. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Even for welcoming us to your amazing place. Thank and you so much. Sharing your uh, inspirational story with yes. our audience. Mm -hmm. And we wish you all the best. And anytime you're in Kenya, unapitia tuko. No tunaongea, problem. Tunaongea kidogo, I'll you? be coming to buy tea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and to you, my people back at home, I hope you enjoyed today's episode of Inspire Kenya. Trust the process because the product is as good as the process. And I always say, no matter what your hustle is, do it and do it diligently. There is no shame in hard work. I want to say thank you so much, KCB Bank, for sponsoring this episode of Inspire Kenya. And as always, allowing me to 
to bring my people content that has the ability to impact their lives. If you want to see the amazing things the bank is doing to help millions of Kenyans in this country, the link is pinned at that comment section below. My name is Lynn Guge. Till next time, bye-bye. Go ahead is believing to make each day a brighter day. A confidence to create opportunity. Going ahead is our courage to do something new. To go ahead. Now, that is the Cajun spirit. <laughs>